three, two, one. This is Science Squawk. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, joining us today. Uh, it's a brand new show. Um, I want to first start out by thanking Amanda, who is the creative mind behind this uh, entire network and the uh, founder for uh, many of you guys that, that haven't been uh, to the uh, restaurant yet, but the founder of the uh, Bella Vista Social Club. Um, it is where everybody goes and, and uh, hangs out and uh, networks and talks about the latest and greatest in the biotech community. So if you haven't been there and you need a job, that's probably another place you can, you can start. Um, so thank you, Amanda, for that. Uh, let's see. So and that's again. in La Jolla, California, between the Sanford Consortium and the Sock Institute. I know. And yeah. I don't, wouldn't flood it for job applicants quite at the moment unless they're keeping <laughs> social distance. <laughs> Steve Chapel here, no matter what it says on my, uh, my Zoom feed. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I want to thank um, Steve Chapel here also for uh, kind of rounding, rounding out my, my rough edges around this. I'm not a, a journalist. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, uh, I and you know scientists. I am some guy that has been in the industry for about twenty years. Ten in the uh, you know off the bench, ten in sales or so ish. I think I lost track now. So thank you, Steve. Um, for those, that we got you for your looks, Abel. Pretty much. Well, for your hair, your haircut. <laughs> yeah, my my hitman look, right? Like my son says. Uh, um, but yeah, for for those that don't know, Steve. Steve has uh, recently authored a book uh, called Breakpoint. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, about that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, if you guys want to know about the environment and uh, learn about some uh, pretty cool predictions in the future, or maybe not so cool. Um, but thank you, Steve, for joining. And uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a different type of show, right? Um, I, I think one of the things that, that um, one of the reasons I took this, this on was uh, for many years, I've always thought that there's just like just a huge gap between what's happening in the scientific community and what's happening in the, the community outside of the, the scientific community. And, and there's just this, um, kind of knowledge base that seems to be uh, missing. And I think that as scientists, we should be doing more to educate our community, uh, both around uh, what the researchers are doing, uh, how it's impacting um, our community and um, the world, uh, you know, in general. So um, rather than sit on the sidelines, I thought this would be a good way for me to, you know, do something about it and uh, take the show and, and, and see what we can, uh, we can do to alleviate some of that. So, um, so with that, um, I'd like to We'll start the segment and uh, introduce our, our very prestigious guest here today. Um, he is the current uh, Chief Scientific Officer and President of the La Jolla uh, Institute for Immunology, uh, Dr. Mitch Cronenberg. And before I pass it on to you, uh, this goes to kind of the basis of, of the show. I'd like to set up the question, pass it to you, and then uh, start from there. It's a little bit of, 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 a, of a humorous uh, question, but... Um, you know, we're left with a lot of kind of, I don't know, uh, misconceptions about what, what science is and what people do in the lab. Um, you've got like Netflix, Stranger Things, they've always show this uh, head scientist and some director, some institute that's doing some creepy thing and, and yada, yada. And we always think that this, you know, uh, people don't really think this is going on, but as you ask people outside the community, they actually do start to internalize this. And actually, I think, um, you know, they start to assume these are the things that we do day in and day out. And maybe that's part of the reason we have this disconnect. And they stay away. So I kind of, I did this experiment and asked a few people of what, you know, what they thought that, what they thought scientists do on a daily basis and what, what they think these heads of institutes do. And two, two drink. questions. They drink. I'm going to tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they drink that. Yes, at the Bella Vista. Uh, <laughs> I found that out fast. <laughs> two of the questions that, that I thought were hilarious to start with was, uh, Dr. Cronenberg, if you can answer this, are you guys making CRISPR babies, and are you, or are you guys making Velociraptor pets? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can start with that, and maybe talk about your role as the head of the institute and what it really means to be, uh, you know, president and running an organization like yours. Because I think there <laughs> was the disconnect right between what what we think, what people think about us, and what they actually think we're doing. Well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Bella Vista is a great place. Uh, I wasn't paid to say that, but it's true. Uh, I haven't read Steve's book, so I can't say anything about that one, but uh, I'm really happy to be talking to you. So uh, no veloc velociraptors and no CRISPR babies, uh, but when I was, back in the day when I was a professor at UCLA, one of the students had an idea for making a transgenic mouse that would 
turn green when it was uh, running, or a hamster that when it was running on a wheel. So it would have a protein that would uh, temperature sensitive glow. And he wanted That's to wild. make, yeah, he wanted to make pets that he would sell. And, uh, uh, but and we were running the transgenic uh, mouse facility at the time. I was doing that with uh, Dr. Hilda Sharutra and uh, we decided that that was a cute idea, but that wasn't how we were gonna direct our, our efforts. Uh, so uh, scientists, uh, generally I find they do like to have fun. They do drink. Uh, a lot of them are, are artistic, have an artistic side. A lot of them are very active physically. Uh, so they're kind of, they're kind of neat people for the most part. There are some high functioning Asperger's in the group, of course, uh, uh, present company excluded. And uh, yeah, but I, they're, and they're very smart. So they're really, really fun to talk to. So my role, uh, I have two roles here. So I am the uh, president of this organization. We have about 480 employees and we run on about $65 million a year budget. And I have to make sure that the brilliant people who work here have enough equipment, enough space, and enough money to, to make breakthroughs and then get out of their way. Uh, and we have uh, a couple of hundred scientists here from about 40 countries, MDs, PhDs, both, and, and they're an amazing group. At the same time, I have my own lab that I try to run and keep up with the other uh, <laughs> 20 or so brilliant people who run labs here. And so we have, we have our own uh, areas of work that we're doing. So I wear two hats. One is uh, running scientific research, and the other is trying to be the overall director of an institute uh, where we, we have to take care of the nuts and bolts and make sure the lights are on and the water's running and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, you're being a little humble. This the La Jolla Institute is a very major institute. I mean, you do work on cancer, on Crohn's disease, on irritable bowel, on other stuff. And maybe you could talk just a bit about what your lab does. What are what are killer cells, and what does it mean? You know, our own body. For somebody who doesn't even imagine that your own body can your immune uh, reactions can get out of hand and cause a type of diabetes or something very bad, and that you are figuring out how that does happen and how to cure it. Sure. Well, the way we look at it, you know, when you do immunology research, uh, you might be working on how to gear up the immune system to fight cancer, but what you discover might be something that is more important for infectious disease or for autoimmunity. And of the three areas that we have, which are cancer, infectious disease, and autoimmunity, autoimmunity is the least understood. It's all those diseases that have funny names when your immune system attacks your body uh, as if it were infected. So in type 1 diabetes, you attack your insulin-producing cells as if they had a viral infection. You wipe them out, and then you have to inject insulin. Multiple sclerosis uh, kills your ability of your nerves to conduct impulses, and you become paralyzed. We work on inflammatory bowel disease because I thought I've always thought that the um, immune system that sits in your gut where you have couple of pounds of bacteria has a special challenge. Most of your body's fairly sterile, but the immune cells in the, in the uh, intestinal mucosa have that special challenge of knowing when it, it's okay. These bugs are okay, don't do anything. But these bugs are the bad ones, you better fight them. So, th so that's, that's very special. Uh, coming back to autoimmunity for a moment, uh, the incidence of the autoimmune diseases are increasing in most of the uh, technologically advanced countries of the world. So this is, a, this is a growing problem. Now every, we're all thinking about uh, COVID-19, which is the crisis of the moment. Uh, but um, th these other diseases are still out there. Cancer is still out there killing 1,700 Americans every day. So these, these other things aren't going away. And immunology touches all of them. We were talking about the microbiome, but I think for the non-scientists, the idea birthday. that there is a microbiome is a big idea. What is a microbiome? The idea that there's two pounds of bacteria in your gut, meaning your intestines, right. that's kind of shocking to a lot of people, especially those doing colonics still. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, your bugs are, are part of your body, and they make chemicals that flow through your body and can affect not just your intestine but your entire body, your behavior, even your brain, there's evidence for that. So, um, and having a diverse and what we call balanced microbiome is important. We're just learning about that though. It's still in the early stage.
So, so I guess before we lost you, the question um, I had was, um, you know, you know, before the COVID nineteen thing hit, there was a you know a lot of a lot of interest in learning about the microbiome, and it was you know making a lot of a. Uh, 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 kind of headlines about the benefits of it. Um, I know it's still early, but is, you know, hand washing is still the best way to, you know, prevent the transmission of COVID, but, you know, using the hand sanitizers, are we affecting long-term kind of the, the, the presence of a beneficial fauna on our hands, or are we delaying development of a, a healthy microbiome within children? Is that something that we know enough about, or, or, or is there a future studies that will look at this, the impact of these hand sanitizers? I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus too much on the hand sanitizers. There is an idea that um, generally our environment is not the same one that we've evolved in and that, uh, that it's leading to hyperinflammatory responses. Some people call that the hygiene hypothesis. It's, um, it's really not, not proven. Uh, and it's actually a very vague because it, you know, it, it's not very well defined in some senses, but there is, there is evidence, for example, if you grow up on a farm, you're less likely to get asthma. That's, that's true. If you have a dog even, you're less likely to get asthma. So it's okay to let your, uh, your young child kiss the dog, basically. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I think as adults, it's probably, uh, it's probably less critical. It seems that a lot of these events that happen get set up early in life. So I, I guess uh, would would that be something that we look at children as they develop them? Because I know there's a lot of moms and dads out there, you know, stuffing hand sanitizers in kids' backpacks as they go to school, telling them to use, you know, a squirt here or there every five minutes. You know, is there that yeah. at that? Level? I think the, I think the the marginal benefit is not so clear. Whether it's really contributing to the rise in food allergies uh, or the increase in asthma or the increase in type 1 diabetes even is not, not so well established. But I think, uh, I think generally, yeah, parents can relax a little more about some of these things. And talk about killer cells. That's also a yeah. big concept like, like yeah. the microbiome, one of the two or three things that are cutting edge and you, you work with that. What, what is a killer cell? What's it killing? Yeah, well, there are... Um, there are different kinds of cells that, whose job it is to kill, <laughs> but to kill appropriately, right? Yeah. Uh, in self-defense. So, um, and they include C CD8 T cells, there are natural killer T cells, and there are something called natural killer cells, which are not T cells. So- I saw know, that so movie, Natural Born T Cells. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, immunology is immunology, never simple. <laughs> So what, let's think about it. Why do you need cells that kill? And the reason is that viruses go in your cells. They have to go in your cells to replicate. They are obligate parasites. And so we need a part of our immune system that can detect the factory that's making more viruses. Your antibodies can detect virus that's, that's traveling around in your body. But your killer cells, their, their job, or one of their main jobs, is to detect the factories that are making more virus or making more of a bacteria that has to go inside your cells and use your cell as a factory. That's really one of the main things that killer cells do. And of course, since immunology is, is complex and multi-layered, we don't just have one kind of killer. So as I said, there are several kinds of killers. And some of them are natural, that's true. So some of them need to be kind of educated before they're killed, but some of them at birth, they're just ready to kill. <laughs> I know so, it sounds amazing. So there's a concept of taking them out of the body and, and boosting up the numbers of them. Of course. Uh, like Carl yeah. June of uh, uh, Pennsylvania did. And then that right. allows, uh, with luck, if there's no side effects, uh, somebody like right. Jimmy Carter reputedly was, his glioma right. breast cancer was uh, helped by that. So that's, that's a right. push that you guys do, I mean. That's right. And in fact, there's even an approved uh, clinical trial now for nat these natural killer cells for, for, uh, for COVID-19, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and like, I mean, everything is being thrown at this problem. And I'm not convinced that natural killers are the solution, but, uh, well, we'll see. They'll do a trial and we'll find out.
So, so you know, as we're going into COVID now, can, can I know LJ has been in the in the news a lot lately. You guys are in the on the forefront of, of, of you know this fight against COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about what LJ is doing specifically, uh, where they're at, and what the next steps are? Yeah. So when this crisis came forward, our investigators, as I mentioned, they really leaped into the breach, if you will, and they had grants and projects to do other kinds of things. The passion may have been to study Zika or Dengue or Lassa or HIV, other viruses, in other words. And, and each of our investigators, particularly those who study viruses, uh, turned their attention to this crisis. And they have system, experimental systems and tools, and they're using those. So, for example, we have labs that are really expert in understanding what is a, a, a T cell, which includes the killer T cells, but other kinds of T cells. What does a T cell see when it sees a virus like COVID-19? What part of the virus is it recognizing? That part is the part that we might want to incorporate in a vaccine, for example. And then we have other labs that are expert on, on B cells and immunology or studying the structure of the virus or identifying antibodies that could be used as a frontline therapy. So a vaccine, you're basically giving your immune system a workout, and then when it sees the real dangerous virus, it's ready to respond. But we can also uh, give people short-term protection by what's called passive immunity. In other words, giving them an antibody or even giving, uh, it won't be as effective, but even giving plasma. You may have heard of this, giving blood from COVID survivors because those people have antibodies. But one of our goals is to identify um, therapeutic antibodies that can be manufactured in great quantity so we could protect healthcare workers, others who cannot be vaccinated. So, uh, and finally, we actually have work on um, validating tests, uh, point of care tests that could be done very quickly for, for looking for antibodies. Because if you have antibodies, it means you've been exposed. And it probably correlates closely with protection, but that, that remains to be proven as well. Uh, but pro it's most likely that if you have antibodies, you are going to be protected, not 100 percent, let's say. So we have I think the work here uh, spans the gamut from looking at uh, T cells and looking also looking at why do some people make a response that basically protects them and other people, maybe their immune response is actually killing them. Some of the people who are who are dying are dying from too much immune response. Uh, what they call a cytokine release syndrome. It's a technical word, but too much inflammatory stuff, too many messages going back and forth that can damage the lung. So we want to know why is it that what's going on when somebody makes that destructive response as opposed to the protective response? It's very important. Can I oh. just ask about, I mean, my big question is always testing. And when yeah. you're saying there's like people can give blood and there's plasma and, and this yeah. type of test and that type of test. Um, how, A, I always ask, where are the tests? Why, why, why aren't they here if other countries are just like rocking it in terms of testing? Um, there were rumors today that they were saying only four of the tests of the 13 are actually work. And then how do they decide who gets tested first? You see in some other cities, people are doing like drive-bys and getting tested. How does that work? You mentioned you want to test the people that are on the front lines. So our, you know, our caretakers right. and, and people yeah. in the medical field. Can you just talk about that a bit? Well, let me, let me talk about the science part first. I'll probably be better at that. But you raise really important questions. <laughs> okay. So there are two kinds of tests. There's tests for the viral genome, okay, for the viral nucleic acid. That's the thing that the virus uses to make more copies of itself. Okay. And that tells you if you have the virus. And then there are tests for antibodies. And antibodies mean that you've seen the virus. You might, uh, you might have cleared the virus and you might be protected. And the antibodies, the antibody tests are useful because your antibodies will probably last for a long time. We don't know how long you'll be protected, whether it's a year or many years, but um, it does indicate that you have been, you have been exposed and you might, and I'll emphasize might, you might be protected. So, um, so those are the two categories. So the, the nucleic acid tests are very, um, are very accurate. I don't think there's much doubt uh, about, their, about their accuracy. The problem has been their availability. Uh, and that's, 
you know, that has to do with the CDC and our government and all kinds of social issues where we didn't get in front of the problem fast enough. And then when the CDC was limiting it, testing only to certain approved tests and their own test was, was not, uh, was contaminated, basically didn't work, then that delayed us even further. And once this ball stops rolling down the hill, you get into all kinds of problems. Um, there's more and more testing, but Dr. Fauci said we need to double the amount of testing. And I'm sure uh, having testing freely available drive up everywhere would be great. I can't explain, you know, who gets tested and who doesn't outside of the, you know, the essential workers. Obviously, being a professional basketball player correlates with being tested. And uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, having money and influence doesn't hurt in this as in many spheres of life. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I think testing needs to be more available and more available in poor, crowded neighborhoods where probably uh, there'll be more cases. Serologic <laughs> testing has a problem that, of accuracy. A lot of the tests out there are just not very accurate. And uh, they're, they're tricky. You want to test that just sees this virus and not uh, the coronaviruses that cause colds, for example. And that, How come we don't have a test that, that really works for COVID and it's, that's the one we say, this is it, and uh, that's the one everybody's going to use? I mean, it seems a little nutty to the lay public, including myself, that there are all these uh, sort of haphazard tests out there. Why isn't there just a government-approved test and that's what we all take? <laughs> what is that a, so obvious? No, that's a, that's a good question. So, when, so normally when the FDA approves a test, it goes through a very long procedure of validation. And realizing that we were behind the curve, I think they've said, okay, we'll do rapid, uh, rapid approval of testing just to get more testing out there. Okay. And there are hundreds, literally, uh, certainly more than 100 different kinds of tests out, hundreds too long. Uh, tests that are being developed and that are, that are or that are out there already. Yeah. Well, heck, you're an expert. Do you recommend one or two? I mean, if you can talk like that, what do you think is the best? You know, Steve, that's a great question, and uh, I think again for the for the typical nucleic acid tests, I think they're for the most part reliable. If you want to know if you've been exposed to, if you have the virus, rather, right? the problem with that is. You might not have it today, but then you go to the supermarket and you didn't have your mask and gloves if they let you in, and you might have it tomorrow. So how, even if you're negative, if you're positive, uh, I would say this, if you are, if you have symptoms, go to the teledoc or go to your doctor and get tested. Meaning, and symptoms means headache, sore throat, chills, certainly dry cough, fever. Okay, those five. Any three or three of those five, let's say, or, or some number of them, get tested. And I think there. I think if you're sick, you can get tested. Um, if you just say, "Gee, I want to know," I, you know, I, I, I had a mild sore throat a couple of days ago, or um, in a high risk age group. Yeah, I don't think. I, I think testing is still not available. Uh, serologic testing. Uh, some of the some of the academic labs have really really good tests. There's some other ones out there that. Uh, I would. I don't know if any of the how good any of the commercial ones are. I don't. Want, I don't want to speak to that at this point. Another question for us septuagenarians. I, I know you think I'm 40 or 50, but why is it more? Why is the virus bad? Worse for uh, us uh, slightly older people. That is 60 and above or 70 and above. You know. Yeah. 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 What's happening? Is our immune response less? Because you. You would. You know. Is that why? Right. Well, it's, it's true that your immune response does wane with age, but it also changes. And it may predispose you to make what's called an inflammatory response, a particular kind of white blood cell, uh, which is uh, called a neutrophil. So some people, as they get older, they're one kind of white blood cell, including some of the killers, let's say, or some of the what are called lymphocytes, they become tired <laughs> or they're, they're less effective. And these other white blood cells uh, become more effective. And that may contribute to this um, uh, you know, immune mediated destruction that you see in some of these older people. So uh, there are trials actually to, to use certain immune blockers for people who are very sick. And you say, well, 
why are you using an immune blocker for a virus? But for some people, they may have too much of a certain chemical in their blood or compound in their blood that, that's ringing an alarm bell. It's inflammation. There's a wound here. There's some problem here. You have too much inflammation, and that's destroying lung tissue. So it, it does reflect the changes in age that happen in the immune system. Of course, a lot of these people, as you know, Steve, a lot of these people who are getting really sick have other health problems. They have uh, cardiovascular problems. They have uh, metabolic syndrome. In other words, diabetes. They have, uh, they have asthma. They have, they have other problems as well that are, that are contributing. Um, and, and well, I'm having a talk problem. with my immune cells tonight, you know, make sure they're feeling good, that there's no cytokine explosions, or is it flurry or storm? It's sort of a weather metaphor. In fact, your father was a, was he a weatherman or a meteorological? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was. You know, he liked the weather, right? There's too much information on the web, but yeah, he did that for some years. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, you look pretty healthy. I mean, he was a weather scientist, is what I mean, because I have an office. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't office. sitting off Boston Village, right. 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 So, uh, uh, exactly. So, but you, you look healthy. You don't look like you have uh, uh, <laughs> metabolic syndrome or... Uh, if yeah. you're a wise ass, you're going to live longer, I think. Are you still out? What about, um, like, <laughs> diet, you, diet and exercise? When you're talking about, you know, the immune system, can you talk a little bit of, to that point? Um, I know we're all stuck at home and we're trying to get, we're very fortunate and there's people that live in food deserts, right? For instance, right. So they don't have access, access to fresh fruits and vegetables and then they're cooped sure. up all day and they can't get sure. exercise. What would you recommend for us to, to be doing right now to, to keep ourselves healthy under these conditions? And again, I think you've nailed it. I think you've nailed it. I think uh, get exercise if you can. Uh, you can walk. Nobody's stopping. Actually, now you can. Uh, I think you can go. You can go surfing now. If it's not, uh, if it's a San Diego city beach, right, uh, or some of the beaches, anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can you can jog. Uh, you can ride a bike. There's so many people out now. Uh, have a routine. I think is important. Uh, stay connected socially as much as you can, and and eat well. Of course, all those things are important for your health. Mm -hmm. Psychological and physical. With that, uh, you know, San Diego is a, definitely an outdoors community. Um, wh where are we with the with the COVID, uh, you know, outbreak here in San Diego? Is it is it safe to go out? Have we? Yeah, let me uh, let me pull that up for you. Um, so I, I have some information on that, and um, if I could only if I could see it now, that would be good. Uh, a lot of people are scared, Mitch, to go. Yeah. Old children are fearful. You know, and, and then if people aren't wearing masks, there's this, you know, who's wearing a mask, who's not wearing a mask. Uh, yeah. You know, what is the safe distance? Uh, right. Had someone write, you know, oh, I got dressed. I was about to go to the grocery store. <sighs> Maybe tomorrow. So there is so much anxiety about going outside. And then you have people that are, are being respectful and mindful and others that just couldn't give a you know Can what? you see that now? Yes. Okay. Right. So this is San Diego, and uh, we have about 3,000 cases. It took us about a month to double the number of cases. So you can see 1,500 about here on, in early April, and here we are at 3,000. And uh, we have about 100 deaths. Um, so we haven't really... We haven't really completely flattened the curve. This is this is interesting. This is the uh, the new cases every day. So what you'd like to see is that there are fewer new cases every day. And you can see it's bouncing around 100, 70 to 100 cases. So it's not really there's a little blip, upward blip here, maybe. But it's it's not doubling every week like in uh, in Italy or some places. But it is. Um, we haven't really, maybe we flattened it, but we haven't, uh, we haven't crushed it. <laughs> so, uh, but let me put it in perspective. So in New York, I have the number. In New York City, there are 160,000 cases, okay? So our 3,000, you know, we have a population, this is San Diego County, we have a population that's about one third of New York City. So we have 3,000 and they have 160,000. So in a way we're doing very well. But when they tested people for antibodies in New York, 
20% of the people had antibodies. That means that one in five New Yorkers, 1.7 million New Yorkers probably have been exposed. So this virus has been circulating since January or whatever. It didn't, it didn't start at the end of February. Okay. Well, let me ask another important question. So in question. San Diego, I... one more point, Steve. In San, oh, Diego, yeah, in San Diego, we don't have many cases, but that we might not have much herd immunity either. And that, so it's, it's, you know, is it half full or What's half herd full? immunity for those uh, yeah. non bison oh, yeah. out there? Right, right. <laughs> herd immunity is a term that refers to the idea that in a population, if you have a certain number of people who are protected by antibodies who are protected, that that will protect the herd. In other words, let's say half the people have been exposed and they're immune and they're protected. Then the virus has a problem spreading since when it tries to jump from one person to another, half the time it gets rejected, it gets slapped down and it can't spread. So it, it dramatically decreases. So there's a social aspect to this. And if we have if we have half the people who are protected, which is what a vaccine uh, would do, uh, or more, a good vaccine would give us more. If we have that kind of protection, then the virus the virus might infect a few people here and there, but it can't spread. Now we have the opposite. Everybody before, let's say December, everybody was susceptible. Nobody had seen this virus before. That's the problem. Well, and also the big question this week, isn't it? Whether you get it. Can you get it again? Yes. Yeah. Do you have an answer to that? Because that's scary, as whatever Amanda would put it. Scary. <laughs> no, it's scary AF. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, you think we're, we're in a world where the people, I mean, I don't know how many times I was out of the country and yeah. all of us. So if, if, if it was already existing in January, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, and then being able to get it again, this is scary. But we well, don't know that. That's a question. But Mitch can help us there. Well, yeah. So uh, we don't know how long uh, you'll be protected, even if you have what are called neutralizing antibodies, antibodies that in certain tests look like they protect the virus from getting into a cell. Uh, the closest thing we, we do know is people look at SARS, the first SARS in China or People look at MERS, which is a related virus that was in the Middle East. And the protection for those, uh, depending on the virus in the study, could be a year to several years. Uh, but yeah, ideally what we'd like is to have, you know, the lifelong protection that you get uh, if you're infected with certain viruses or, or certain vaccines like polio vaccine or smallpox uh, vaccine that have really wiped out infections or other kinds of infections that pretty much give you long-term uh, long immunity. Chicken pox is an example. If you get chicken pox, you're not going to get it again, except when you get to be Steve's age, you might get shingles, but that's... <laughs> I had that very, very expensive uh, uh, Shingrex or something. It's a funny yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that TB, you know, the, yeah. the stamp, the TB stamp. Steve. Yeah. Well, the, th the thing about the shingles is a complete, uh, the chicken pox, completely different kind of virus it basically goes to sleep in your cells. Nice. And then when, as your immune system gets tired, you know, I've been fighting infections for uh, Mitch or for Steve for so many years now, I'm tired of doing this. As your immune system gets a little tired, the virus can reactivate. That's basically what shingles is. But my point is that if a kid gets chicken pox, that kid's most likely going to be protected for decades. So uh, we don't know that that will be true for SARS. Let me put it that way. And that, that we... That remains to be seen. People are doing experiments. So people are, uh, for example, are immunizing macaques. They're uh, immunizing monkeys with experimental vaccines. And of course, uh, experimental vaccines are, are in phase one trials for patients. And, and we'll, we'll find out how well, how well those vaccines work. Do you have to have a trial with people or can you look at it on a molecular cell level and decide? Uh, eventually, you, you, have to, you have to have a trial with people. You can get a very good, important indications uh, in the test tube or in the, in the tissue culture dish. Those are very important. Uh, animal models can be helpful, uh, but ultimately, yeah, you have to you have to you have to test people. There's no way no, around it. Abel is a major part of 10x Bio, which is uh, just ripped up as a four billion dollar, I believe, a company. <laughs> it's, a it's a major thing. Um, 
uh, what what are the commercial aspects of that? Because it's science squawk, right? I mean, um, sure, people will give away cures and all that sort of stuff, but it, but there may be some implications for many people who work uh, and hang out at the Bella Vista when it's open. Um, yeah. You know, this is a big business, and without getting into all of that, uh, what do you think of the implications for pharma and for diagnostic? Well, the, sh the short term is kind of obvious. First of all, everything's disrupted. Uh, many people who want to work can't work. Uh, some people can still work. Uh, they don't have school-aged children. They're, they're, they're deemed essential workers. They have to keep uh, distance. And uh, everybody is focused on this one problem, which is reasonable. Everything is being thrown at it. Trust me, every kind of therapy you can think of, things that you know can't possibly work, like injecting bleach, uh, uh, <laughs> but, um, but other things that might work, but that are, frankly, that are long shots, in my opinion. Uh, so, so there's a kind of, it's a very interesting situation from a from a commercial point of view, I don't think, uh, you know, from a pharma point of view, vaccines are not big money makers, right? A vaccine is a treatment you give somebody, and if it's a good vaccine, it works for years, and usually they're pretty cheap to manufacture. So I do think that there's, uh, there's a kind of a charitable or a humane uh, reason for pharmas to be, to be working on this and for other companies. And I've had many companies contact us and say, how can we help you? And sometimes it's difficult to figure out, you know, exactly what they have and whether it, it, it fits with what we can do. But uh, companies are, are, are really interested in trying to do this to help. But I don't think, um, I don't think commercially it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a huge impact. Not in the same way that, uh, you know, some, some of the cancer neurotherapies might have or things of that kind. Now, you mentioned the, the vaccines not being as big of a business. Now, can you uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the use of vaccines and then drug discovery efforts that are in the area? Like for the layman, you know, why are people just developing compounds, chemical compounds, and how does that differ from a vaccine? Yeah, well, you know, the, the vaccine is, is preventative, of course, first of all. And uh, for it to be feasible, it has to be very safe. Uh, you're giving it to healthy children, basically, or healthy adults, um, and and not very expensive. Yeah, there are no there are chemicals are being developed. Um, uh, you know, known known drugs as well as uh, that have been used for other kinds of viral infections or chemical screens are going on. So as I said, when I said everything's being thrown at this, there is a lot. And and you're right, Abel. You make a point that a treatment. Uh, a treatment could be more remunerative and, and but, you know, un, unlike, look, to be honest, unlike a chronic condition where you need to be treated over and over again, uh, people are going to have this illness and it's going to be very acute. They may need some treatment and then it's over. So there is, uh, from a commercial point of view, there's, there's certainly money to be made there, but it's not the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, repeated or chronic treatments that you would get in a cancer immune therapy or for an autoimmune therapy or something like that. So um, the, the financial incentives are, are a little bit different. It doesn't mean that companies, there aren't companies who want to make vaccines or there aren't companies who want to make treatments for this. Of course there are. So and Mitch, sorry, I was just thinking, and that's actually a good thing, right? Because if you're taking the money out of it, then it's going to lend itself to more collaboration for the greater good. Am I right? Yeah, you know, I think that that's an interesting point, and I think there is really, there is really something to that. And, and uh, I think this uh, this COVID uh, antibody consortium that Gates funded at the La Jolla Institute, mm -hmm. uh, that's being led by uh, Erica Sapphire, Eric Alden Sapphire. I think that's an example because what that consortium is going to do is going to compare antibodies side by side in a set of tests for their neutralization ability and other features and. Um, a lot of the antibodies are coming from companies. And so companies are, you know, each company retains the uh, intellectual property rights to their comp what's called composition of matter. In other words, if they have a specific antibody, uh, but uh, they've all agreed to collaborate to do this, to see which ones might, might be more effective 
And this, these are these are not vaccines, as I mentioned, but these are these treatments where it's too late for a vaccine. You're giving somebody some antibody to mop up the virus, basically. But that's one example of collaboration. So, yeah, I think that's out there. We had uh, Gary Robbins on earlier today. He was a, a biotech uh, journalist for the, for the sure, United I know. And, uh, you know, he brought up a, a you know point on on how the COVID situation is affecting you know student recruitment at UCSD in our community. You know, that's a huge part of our of our communities is the uh, academic side and, and and students and whatnot. We rely a lot on postdocs, right? On to do a of lot course. of things. and we grab yeah. all over the world, right? Some of the brightest minds. They all want to come to San Diego, right? Is, is COVID affecting, will it affect that recruitment process on the, on the research side um, going into 2021, 22, et cetera? Or will we see a decline in, in foreign recruitment of, of postdocs and, and grad students? I think there, there could be. The problem is we don't know, um, we don't know to what degree we'll be operating normally, let's say next fall. I, uh, I had an email this morning with a, old friend of mine who's a, a professor at University of North Carolina, and he is having, he's going to be part of a meeting with the chancellor to talk about how are they going to operate in the fall? Okay, now the classes are remote, but what happens, what are they going to be able to do in September or October? I don't think any of us know. San Diego will always be a magnet uh, for talented people uh, because of the, the scientific talent that's already here because of the lifestyle, of course, the, the sun and the city are just amazing. But yeah, if people uh, aren't allowed to travel or feel it's not safe. U United States, we're number one. We have the most cases in the world right now. Hope that will, that will change soon. But if it doesn't change, I think that would be uh, a negative for people to come here. Okay. So do you think that we'll siphon, if we can't recruit from abroad, are we going to be, like you said, you know, San Diego is very desirable, so is San Francisco, uh, Boston area, really bright sure. minds. Are we going to be si siphoning from other, you know, uh, lesser known hubs or less uh, abundantly populated areas like yeah. schools? Yeah. Out, you know, Potentially. Areas. You know, I, look, I think people, people are... We're tired of this, right? I mean, we have to we have to maintain our social distancing and our our solid, relatively so, uh, uh, solitary, if you will, lifestyles. But um, uh, I think young people who are training to be to get PhDs, to be postdocs, uh, to start their own first lab, to go work in industry, they, they're going to want to get on with it. So I think um, as long as the caseload goes down and it's reasonably safe, and maybe yeah, we won't be shaking hands, okay. Uh, or uh, certain other kinds of behaviors will be reduced. But I think people are going to want to get back to normal. I don't see us necessarily siphoning off people. Uh, there'll be competition. Yeah, people can't come from abroad, and we're all looking at the, the labor pool from uh, inside the country. There'll be maybe increased competition. Sure, that's possible. Um, and it's, it's really hard to predict. You mentioned competition. In a situation like this, is competition better for this environment, or is you know everybody kind of piecemealing the the whole drug discovery process, the whole vaccine discovery process, and taking ownership of certain par parts? Is that a better method, or should we have everybody kind of go their own route and see who can come up with the best solution? Uh, you know. Well, I think it's a mixture. You know, uh, everybody wants to make their mark. Everybody wants to, uh, you know, have something where they can say they they contributed. That's 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 normal. That's what how people are. But at the same time, we uh, we're very social, and and we do call, scientists collaborate all the time. There's there's an enormous amount of collaboration that goes on. I don't know how people got the idea that we don't collaborate. Uh, I feel like we collaborate very extensively. But there are cases. There are also competitions that occur at the same time. Um, so there are groups that collaborate and other groups. Um, the uh, federal agencies require us to share our data. Um, so it's always a mixture of the two. And, and I think we have a pretty good balance. And I think with this crisis, there's a, there's a lot of attempts to, to collaborate and to work across uh, lab and institutional boundaries. People want to get this out of the way. Now, 
You gotta unmute yourself, Steve. Oh, did Steve try to go? Boomer moment, boomer moment. Boomer moment. Yeah. Well, there, there are a lot of motorcycle races back, to the beach outside of my window here in Hawaii. It's rough, so I had to, I had to mute it. But my, um, in fact, I, I just had a senior moment, Amanda. Could you please ask the next question? Sorry, I've got a. Well, I wanted to go numeric. back to social distancing. You were you were yeah. showing the graphs, and I think uh, we got a little sidetracked. But you know, as a, a business owner, of course, I'm curious. You know how that's gonna unfold or pan out wow. in opening the doors to Bella Vista. But I'm more concerned as a mom. And so, you know, I want to get my son out. Like, I'd like to go take him and surprise him and see the bioluminescence tonight. But I just don't know if taking him outdoors when, when hundreds of people are flocking to the beach is, is a good idea, if it's a safe idea, um, or if it's still a lot of a risk. And we should be staying home as much as we can. And we should be wearing the protective Mass. No pressure. No, those are tough questions. I, my personal feeling is that a lot of the contagion comes from close quarters, indoors, short distances, um, and more prolonged contact. So, uh, you know, there are uh, so called aerosols that can go longer than a few feet. Um, and is there contagious virus in aerosols? And what's the chance of exposure if you're, uh, if somebody jogs by you and they're 10 feet away uh, and they're, they're not wearing a mask? Um, you know, personally, um, I'm not convinced that that's a, a big risk. I would say if you're indoors, uh, like in, in our institute now, we're probably going to open up in mid, in, mid, in sometime next month. Okay. But so we're going to ask. Yeah, we're going to ask. I mean, now we have the COVID-19 research, but we'll probably let most of the researchers back, but they'll, we'll ask them to wear masks when they're around other people. But in, we're talking about indoor environments. So if they're anywhere in the hallways or public places, wear a mask and, and you know, protect your hands, wear gloves and so on. Keep your distance. But outdoors, uh, yeah, I know people congregated, but personally, I feel like, uh, you yeah, People should, it's it's probably okay to, to go for a walk with your kid and just, you know, yeah, you can have a mask with you. So if suddenly there's a group of people around, you put you put the mask on. Right. But the mask, you know, the mask is more, the way I, the way most of us see it, the mask is more, if you're asymptomatic, prevent you from spreading it, right? It's a social act in a way. It's not so much, uh, it, I really don't think the risk is that, is that great, frankly. But it's more of an act of respect and a social act to say, well, if I were asymptomatic and spreading virus, maybe there's somebody around me who, who would be uh, very susceptible. So it is. I would take him outside. <laughs> it's about. I wouldn't, to, right? I wouldn't go to Newport Beach. I was very crowded there. Sorry. Well, I think that. he's using it to be upstairs playing video games. I think I'm. Yeah, of course. And yeah. I was going to say not dose and duration, as the toxicologists say. Dose. And that's duration. right. That's right. That's right. That's a bad thing. But then well, what do you think? And uh, you don't have to answer, but what do you think about, uh, you know, Georgia and other states really opening up and like, uh, you know, tattoo parlors and theaters and gymnasiums? I mean, those are all indoor things. Yeah, the gymnasium. See, wow. Are we going to see yeah. an outburst in two or three weeks? In a way, that's the proof of the virus pudding, right? Yeah. If that happens, then that was a bad idea. If it doesn't, that's going to change the country's attitude. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think it's dangerous, but yeah, they're running an experiment on their population. You know, the other country that's doing that is Sweden. Yeah. So Sweden right. uh, has really, uh, only for older people or susceptible, has had the uh, uh, social distancing in place. And otherwise, they've been rather open. Right now, they have a couple of thousand cases. But I look at the stats and it, it took them two weeks to double. So uh, that's faster than what's going on in San Diego. Let me put it that way. But we have 3,000 cases. So we have, we have a few more cases in Sweden. They have a, a larger population, but actually not that much larger. Uh, a lot, and much larger area, too, to spread Much out. larger area. Yeah. That's important, Steve. You're right. So uh, I'm curious to see what happens in Sweden. Because uh, if you look at a curve of Sweden, yeah, there are many cases, but that 
the slope of that curve is pretty steep, meaning um, maybe in, in two months, they're going to have a lot of cases for their relatively small population. I have one more question. Do you think this is going to come back? I mean, we talk about bird no. flu, SARS, MERS. Um, are, we, are we in a kind of um, uh, every a cycle of every few years we're going to have a corona or something between that and Ebola? I mean, is it a is our globalism and what is, is, is that going to happen? We're going to have more pandemics and uh, exactly when, Mitch, we need to know. So I can come back to Hawaii. No, you're right. I think, I think it's perfectly predictable mm. that in a, with a population of seven and a half billion people, uh, millions flying every day, uh, encroaching on um, the wild areas, the rainforests and whatever, uh, and with whatever kinds of animals who are in contact with, close contact, uh, due to settling or dietary habits. Um, yeah, I, this isn't the last one, but it's, um, it's kind of like predicting hurricanes. We don't know uh, when and where, how frequently. Um, but I, I think this, this is perfectly predictable. I, I, could, I don't think there's any uh, you know, immunologist or biomedical researcher who would have said, I never thought something like this was ever going to happen. Luckily, it, it could be worse. I mean, the, the tricky thing about this virus is that we carry it around before we have symptoms and then we infect other people, right? If, if it had a shorter lag between infection and symptoms and you isolate the people before they go around and, and, and infect 10 other people or 2.4 other people, whatever the real number is, we'd be better off. But the good thing is the fatality rate is probably around 1%, which is terrible. But what, imagine, what if the fatality rate were 10%, but with the same lag between uh, infection and symptoms? So it could have been a lot worse. And I don't want to leave you with a really scary thought, but who knows what the next one's going to be like or when it's going to happen. But we have to be prepared. And, and that's where uh, you know technology and research on vaccine development and on uh, virology and immunology is going to help us for the future. No question. Awesome. Right. And, and you, you're, you mentioned the predictability of it. And I guess not to fan the, 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 the flames here, but, um, you know, what I read was that, you know, we were lucky that this hit kind of at the tail end of the flu season. Now, some are predicting a second possible wave. Now, what's the implication of having, you know, both kind of overlap? Or is that predictability you're mentioning, is that something that we can avoid? You know, not having the flu overlap with uh, these outbreaks of, of, of COVID? Well, yeah, I mean, the, Dr. Redfield, uh, the head of the CDC, was talking about that, of course. And, um, yeah, there could be a, a rebound, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and... There could be a, uh, an overlap with flu, and that would, in, in his words, make it more complicated. Um, I guess we really don't know. Um, there are models, of course, but we really don't know how fast this is going to, uh, the case number will go down, and whether we'll have enough um, social control combined with some level of herd immunity, not very much likely to, to avoid a rebound. To me, it seems... Well, I'm coming off as a real pessimist, but to me, it seems like there will be a rebound in the fall and uh, it won't necessarily be as bad as this first one because we all know what we're up against, right? We know that it's SARS-CoV-2 and we know this, people know the symptoms, there'll be more tests. So if there is a rebound, I predict it will be, it'll be more control, uh, controllable, will make a better, much better response, but will society tolerate another four weeks of social isolation? Yeah, the question. If, well, if we know ahead of time and we can choose who we can isolate with, perhaps. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, our, our predictability model, right? <laughs> that moves into the dating app that Amanda's. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about the QVC another time. Yeah. Dating in a time of COVID 19, right? Yes, that's going to be our next special. We're getting <laughs> out here, and we definitely appreciate your time. Is there is there anything that we can do, as like the community can do, to help uh, LGI out? Are there are there volunteers that are needed? Are, uh, messaging, like you know, donating blood or something? Yeah. Is there anything that we can do to help? Well, 
if you know people who have uh, recovered, we definitely want uh, donating blood. It's very important. And um, I, there's a link. I, I'm, there's a link on our website where you can find out how to do that. Um, other than that, I think the other thing that's very important is uh, communicating science like you're doing. That's very important. Of course, we, uh, we're always looking for donations. Uh, we need to outfit our BSL-3 facility, biosafety level three, so we can grow large quantities, relatively large quantities of the virus for doing tests. Now we work with pieces of the virus, genes from the virus, so there's no, there's no infectivity. Or we work with cells from virally infected people, but then we treat them so it's safe. But we'd like to have this facility funded and, um, and, and, and on our website, I think you can find a link for the kind of equipment that we need. So we're looking for, we're always looking for a uh, partnership with those who have the means for philanthropy. Uh, again, most of our funding comes from the US government and National Institute of Health. But that partnership is really critical. We can definitely look at that, that link and put the uh, links in the comments and, and uh, definitely help you out. Well, with thank that. you. Thank you, Abel. Um, Anything else from uh, Steve, Amanda? I can't wait till we can sit and have a beer on the terrace. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> of course. And, and it gives uh, me hope to hear that, that you guys are, um, oh, you know, there's talks of opening up soon because our, obviously our, that's our clientele. What's one thing you've learned personally before we wrap it up? What have you learned personally or has there been a personal change since you've had to self-isolate? Um, something positive or? Well, uh, there's positives and negatives, of course, but I, I should end on something positive. And that is that uh, when I go out for a jog or a walk or, or something, I like seeing all the people on the street. I mean, I mean, I'm not jostling with them. You know, we always separate ourselves. People walking their dogs, the people riding their bikes, uh, the air is cleaner. Uh, you know, there's, people seem to be taking more time some of my uh, adult children came home to live with us, and uh, so we're having a lot of quality time with them. And one of them, he can go back and forth to LA, so when we get tired of each other, he goes and lives in his apartment in LA. It's a perfect situation. So uh, now that there's, there, there is a plus side to uh, a temporary enforced slowdown from the drinking out of the fire hose lifestyle. And, um, but many people are suffering. And so that's a small gain on top of a big loss, I'm afraid. Very accurate. I just wanted to say thank you for what you do, as they say. I mean, you're one of the people who is making things better for all of us and giving us hope of uh, how we can get out of this uh, tragedy. Well, it's our passion to, to study immunology and to make an impact on human health. That's what the Hoya Institute for Immunology is about, and also our other colleagues on the base. But thank you very much. Appreciate of it. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you for spending this time. I'm sure a lot of uh, scientists and non-scientists alike appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to explain some of these things that are a little bit more complex. And, uh, you know, some, some of them, this is the first exposure to, to science in the area. So a big thank you to you and your crew and your institute. So, uh, Thanks, so that's a wrap. We made it. Yeah. Ciao, Thanks, Bill. Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. I love you guys. You. Good evening, and we'll see you soon. I hope so. Oh, Take care. Monday, 5 o'clock. Good job, baby. All right. Bye-bye.